Amen. Hey, I'm glad you're here today. Everybody that's in this building today, uh, just weathering the storm. Amen. I mean, come on now. I mean, hell is literally freezing over right now. It's okay to laugh in church. Y'all can laugh. Wow. My goodness. Praise God. I'm just picking with y'all. Hey, some of y'all are viewing. We, we welcome all of those that are viewing us online right now. Some of you may be, may be watching on our mobile app right now. And so I want to encourage those that, that are not only here, but those that are viewing us online right now, possibly, uh, you know, viewing through the, the, uh, through the mobile app. You can go to both iTunes and Google Play, and you can download that mobile app for free. It's New Covenant PA is the is the channel the title the hang uh, handle whatever you want to call it new covenant pa on the mobile app uh, you might be joining us through the website right now we're simultaneously streaming through our website newcovenantpa.com and, and so uh, it, it's there's so much out there uh, for us to be able to use technology wise we're using it for the glory of God to bring him honor to bring him praise uh, you can give into the ministry here at New Covenant. You can give into what God is doing. You can give into the to the building fund. Anything that we're doing, whether it's salt and light, uh, the missions that we do to to reach into our community and to provide food items and and in things that people need, you can do that through the text to give motion, which is uh, you text the word New Covenant to seven seven nine seven seven. Again, that's New Covenant to seven seven nine seven seven, and. Uh, uh, you can you can give on that mobile link. Uh, you can do uh, all sorts of things uh, through that text to give motion. And uh, again, I want to remind everybody about our YouTube channel. If you have not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, New Covenant Port Author, I'm telling you, uh, go subscribe to our YouTube channel and and check out past content. Pa check out what we've already posted on there and what we're continuing to post and uh, get involved. I mean, it's there's edited messages on there. There's edited versions of uh, past sermons and sermon series. And God will just, he'll touch your life. I promise you, God will touch your life through these messages. Just as radically, if not more radically, than he has already touched me in the preparing and, and, and through the studying for these messages. Amen? Hey, I, I, again, I want to welcome y'all here to New Covenant, and I'm thankful for all of y'all that are truly weathering the storm. Uh, I, you know, this is something we haven't seen in, I don't even know how long. I think since 97 was the last time we had this kind of weather in our area, you know, and it's kind of like, I, I saw somebody post, a, 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 um, again, I have to remind y'all, I don't do a whole lot of Facebooking, but I did, uh, I watch a couple of people. Uh, I have to watch my wife, because, you know, if, if I'm not liking or loving some of her posts, she's like, you don't care about me. So, you know, I go check out her post, you know, and I'll check on my mom every now and then. Uh, but I don't spend a whole lot of time on social media. Um, but somebody posted a meme that I loved. And, 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 and it was a picture. <laughs> it was a picture of, I think it was um, uh, the, in the movie 300. What was that guy's name uh, that played in there? What was his title in the movie, though? Uh, King something. I don't remember. Anyway, he's standing there, you know, in all of his warrior garb, and he's, like, ready to go fight King Leonidas. And then he was ready to go fight, and it's like Texans preparing for a hurricane. You know, and then there was another picture of, of like a freeze coming, you know, and it's like there was this wimpy looking thing or something along those lines when there was a freeze coming. We're freaking out, you know, it's like pandemic again all over, you know, but uh, God is able to bring us through. Amen? Amen. God gives us the strength, the ability to weather the storm. I, it doesn't matter what storm it is. Now listen, I, I'm not I'm not saying this just because we're facing a, a you know an ice storm or something like that, but but uh, God is able to to give you the strength and the ability to weather the storm. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. He gives you the peace and the comfort to weather that storm in your life, Amen. because it can be very tumultuous. Tumultu it can be very traumatic. Uh, so, but God will give you the things that you need to go through these things. 
I want to remind you of what we talked about last week because last week I, I, I spoke about, about self-condemnation and about shame. And a lot of times in our life, we put shame on our own self. We shame ourselves for the decisions that we've made in our life. We, we shame ourselves over something that we have allowed ourselves to get involved in. And we allow this shame to dominate our lives. And it's, it, begins to, it, it begins to dominate our decision-making process on a daily basis. And we begin to live under the shadow or under the condemnation of past decisions. And that's an unfortunate thing. Because he did not call us to live in, in the past of yesterday's decisions or yesterday's condemnation. I think we all understand shame. I think we all understand what shame is. And I think we all understand what it is to allow shame to dominate our lives. And I want you to know today, just as I said as I was praying, there is hope. And that's kind of what I'm titling today's message, There is Hope. And I've preached about hope before. I've talked about hope and how hope comes in and gives you the strength that you need to continue to press forward and to press into what God has for you. You know, I, 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 when we start talking about shame and we start talking about the shame dominating our life, how many people remember the movie Lion King? Y'all remember the movie Lion King? That was an awesome movie, right? right? Well, there were some things that went on inside Lion King, and I don't think you, I don't, I don't think most people really truly understand it because we get wrapped up in the whole story. We get wrapped up in, you know, in in, in this young lion that that becomes the king and and takes over and all that. But something took place, and I don't know if y'all remember this scene or not, but shame dominated little Simba. Because little Simba made a decision to be defiant against his father. His father said, don't, don't go somewhere and don't go do this certain thing. And he was saying that because he knew the outcome of that decision. If he was to choose to make that decision, he knew the repercussions of what was going to happen. And so he was trying to guide little Simba in his life. But little Simba was defiant, and he chose to do things his own way. Has anybody ever chose to do things your own way? Sure. Anybody ever said, no, I know better. I'll do what I want to do. I'm a, I'm a grown-up now. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't need somebody telling me what to do. Oh, I've done it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And see, but here's the thing is, is that little Simba decided to do something that he shouldn't have done, and Mufasa had to come to his rescue. And in the coming to Simba's rescue, Mufasa fell and was, was, was killed. And the shame came over Simba because although Simba didn't kill his father, the decisions that he made were part of the effect that controlled that that whole entire situation you see there were a lot of things going on on that whole realm of things there was a whole lot going on i mean there was a stampede that took place that wasn't simba's fault it wasn't simba's fault that the stampede came on the scene it wasn't Simba's fault that that scar wanted his brother dead so that he could take the throne that, that wasn't Simba's fault but see Simba's decision was a part of the overall picture of the whole scene and shame came upon Simba and he ran off he ran to a far country he ran away now, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, think about this situation. Simba, Simba didn't run off and, and, and become a villain and, you know, rob banks and, you know, start doing drugs as a result of his bad decisions or something like that. I mean, he, he, he found some little new little buddies, you know, and they come up with this, you know, Kuna Matata thing, you know. And no worries, right? Kuna Matata. Life is good. And he lived that life for a while. And the whole time there was a, a nation. Now, look, I know this is a Disney thing, but you've got to wrap your mind around the yes. scope of this yes. because there was a nation that needed him yes. as king. Yes. 
There was a nation that needed someone to stand up and to be hope for others. And a lot of times, and let me tell you something, there's not a person in this room today, and there's not a person watching on the other end of that camera, that God, I'm telling you, God has something for you. And there are people in your path that you influence. And the decisions that you make and the things that you say, people are watching and people are listening. And you have great influence. You have influence over people that I may never see or speak to. And you might say, well, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm not hurting anybody. My decisions aren't hurt. Let me tell you something. Somebody is looking up to you. Amen. A little brother or a little sister might be looking up to you. A cousin, a niece, a nephew, a co-worker that does not know Jesus is watching to see how you are navigating through situations in your life. And they need to see that hope in you. Yes, you are important. And the decisions that you make in your life are extremely important. But I want you to understand this because, you know, just like in Simba, and obviously we know the, we know the triumph that into the story. You know, Simba came in, he defeated Scar, he took over, he, he gave hope to the Sahara land or whatever in the, in the movie, The Lion King. And he gave hope to them. And I'm here to tell you today that people need to see hope in you. And they need you, whether you think they need you or not, or whether, whether you think that you're a voice or not a voice. You are a voice. And people need to see this hope. And I want you to see here today, and when we leave today, and by the end of this, of this time that we have together, I want you to know that there is hope. And I want to show you through the life of Peter. I want to show you through the life of Peter because I think uh, a lot of us, if not all of us, can relate to Peter. I think we can kind of, you might say, well, I, you know, Peter was a fisherman. I'm not a fisherman. It doesn't really matter what you are. It doesn't really matter what you do because we can just see that, you know, Peter, Peter followed Christ. Here's the thing. It's a very simple. We can all relate to this story because, because Jesus called Peter just like he's called you. Just like he called me. He called Peter. And he called Peter in his environment. He didn't say, hey, Peter, I want, you to, I want you to go get that fishy smell off of you. And I want you to put on a new clean pair of clothes because, you know, those clothes stink. You know, you've been fishing all, all night long. And, uh, oh, and by the way, I need you to clean up your mouth because you got a potty mouth. And I need you to clean that up. And then I want you to come and follow me when all that's done. No, he didn't say that. He said, follow me. He said, drop your net. That means he was in the middle of what he did for a living. He was in the middle of his lifestyle. He said, drop your nets and follow me. He didn't say, go home and bathe. He said, follow me. He called him in what he was in. Now, we know the story. We know Peter followed him. We know he dropped his nets. But there's so much more to the story. There's so much more to the life of Peter that most people don't see. And I'm going to share that today. Peter was a rough guy. He was rough. I mean, in all understanding of what a fisherman is, and I've used this analogy before, how many people have watched Deadliest Catch? Oh, come on now. Don't lie. This is... I'm the only one that's sinning in this place. They got to bleep out like every other word. Now, I want you to get a, just get a picture in your mind of Peter being on the Northwestern with Sid and, and, you know, and all the group of guys, you know, talking and every other word is... Yep. Beep, beep. And it's beep, beep, beep. And she's, Tina's like, why are you watching? I'm catching crap. And, and it's like... I don't know. Judge me. Just go ahead. Judge me. I don't care. I just get this picture of Peter, this rough guy. Got probably, you know, looks like a bowler maker. You know, he's got like three teeth in his mouth. <laughs> just a rough dude. He's rough. I mean, think about the statement. You know, when... When Jesus and Peter were having the conversation and he, and he says, he says, Lord, I'll die for you. 
I'll go to the, I'll go and I'll die for you. When Jesus was saying, when, when, when Jesus was uh, saying, Lord, just, just let, them, let them all disperse because Jesus didn't want them killed. He didn't want them hurt. Jesus wanted to protect them. He said, Lord, just let them, let them go. And, and then Peter says, I will not leave you. I will not leave your side. I will stand here with you and I'll die if I have to. Well, we know that didn't happen. We know that just like everybody else, he scattered too. In the fear of the moment, in the fear of what was going on, he was no different than anybody else. And he scattered as well. And that's interesting because when, we're, when we look in the, into the garden, when we look at the, at the scene of what's taking place in the garden of Gethsemane, do you realize that, that when, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, and he told the disciples, he says, Guys, look, I, I, want you, I want you just to wait right here, and I want you to pray, and I want you to be on guard, and, and, and I just, just, just right here, guys. And then he says, Okay, guys, he took his inner group which Peter was in the inner group. He says, guys, I just want y'all to get a little more intimate. I want y'all to get a little bit, come on over here and let's go a little bit further. And guys, I just, I, I, I want you just to understand the, 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 the gravity of the moment. Now I'm ad-libbing a little bit, but I want you to understand that, that Jesus loved Peter. Jesus loved John. I mean, Jesus loved them all, don't get me wrong, just like he loves you. But I'm just saying that he, he loved Peter. And he told Peter, he says, Peter, and, and you probably know the story where Jesus went and prayed, he came back, they were asleep, and he was like, guys, wake up. You can't pray for one hour? You, you, you can't be alert for one hour? I mean, I'm about to go to the cross for you, and you can't hold your eyes open for one hour? I mean, I don't think we really get the, the frustration that probably was there at that moment. And let me tell you something, Jesus got frustrated. And we can find numerous times throughout the Scripture where Jesus was frustrated with a situation. Yeah. And we can really truly see the frustration in the wording when Jesus says, Guys, come on! I mean, I, I, this is how I would respond. It's like, it's like we're having a prayer meeting and we're going to be interceding for a certain situation in the ministry and then I come and I find y'all all laid out in the sanctuary, not under the control of the Holy Spirit, but because you're so tired you can't hold your eyes open. The frustration, come on, y'all. I mean, we're pressing in. I don't know if that's how Jesus was, but it's so, it, 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 it helps me understand it. <laughs> But this is what happens is, is that, you know, Judas comes, and I'm not going to read the scriptures, but it's, we find this in John chapter 18. But in these scriptures, we, we see where, where Judas comes to betray Jesus. And Peter's right there by his side. Now listen, you can, you can read every translation you know. I, I, think they, I, I think they miss this in the translation. I, this is my own personal opinion, okay? But I think they miss this in the translation. Uh, almost every translation you will find, and every one of them in, in any of the Gospels that you find this story, it says that Peter drew a sword out. But when you look at the true definition, the Greek definition of the word, Peter did not carry an actual sword like a Roman soldier. I want you to understand this. He was a fisherman. He, the, 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 the word that is said there, it's a knife. And it was a big knife, don't get me wrong, but it kind of looked like a fillet knife. It kind of had a little curve to it. And, I mean, it was really good. You know, you could shank someone. You could hook them at the same time, you know. I mean, it was just a knife that was made for a fisherman. And so this is the kind of weapon that Peter carried. And I know, y'all can go ahead and look. King James, New Living Translation, New International Version, the Michael Version. It doesn't matter what translation you look in, they all say sword, every one of them. But look up the Greek definition because it's actually talking about a curved knife. And it, and it, and it wasn't no sissy knife. It was a get out of my way or I will cut you kind of knife. <laughs> and that's exactly what Peter did. He pulled that knife out. And he cut the ear of Malchus off because he said, Lord, no one will get between you and me. 
and I will die for you. And then, and then Jesus had to rebuke him and said, Peter, put that thing away. Because if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Now again, it says sword. But I don't believe that it was a sword. I believe that it was a knife that fit the character of who he was. It was the kind of knife that when Peter would get off of the boat and he would go over to the saloon, wherever the fishermen hung out after they had been fishing all day or all night, they wanted a cold one. Now, they didn't have refrigerated stuff back then, so it was a warm one. <laughs> But he had to still protect himself. Because we all know if you've watched Deadliest Catch, them guys make a truckload of money. So fishermen were probably well off, but they had to work really, really hard for what they had. I don't know. I mean, Peter was a fisherman just like his daddy was. Probably just like his daddy was. It was a family business. He knew how to fish. There was no doubt about that. He knew his profession. And wasn't no one going to tell him how to fish? And well, that'll, that'll come in a little bit later. But it's interesting when in this story that, that, that Peter said, I'll never leave you, Lord. I will not leave your side. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows tomorrow morning, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Are you serious? Don't even come in here with that. I mean, he was rebuking the Savior. You just don't do that. I, I, you don't get mad at the Savior and rebuke the Savior. I'm sorry. That's not going to work out well for you. I, I, don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what Jesus had to say to him other than he probably just rebuked him and said, Satan, I mean, uh, not, not in this particular story, but he probably just said, Peter, back up. You know that I'm supposed to go to the cross for you. But the thing is, is that when the disciples were, were arrested, the, the, the disciples scattered all over the place. And the next scene that we see when Jesus is being tried, we see Peter standing at a fire because it's cold. And so Peter is, like a lot of people, warming his hands by the fire. And this is very significant, and I'm going to touch on this in just a moment. You're going to see what I'm saying. But G Peter was standing there warming and it says that the very first denial that Peter did, there was a woman that was standing there watching at the gate. And she says, aren't you? you yeah, you, you're one of those disciple guys. You're, you're one of those guys that follows the Jesus, right? You're one of them. No, 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 no. You got the wrong guy. That ain't me. Immediately, he, not even two sentences before that, he was like, Lord, I'll die for you if I have to. No, 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 no. Wait a minute, I don't know him. The second time he denies Christ, there were other men that were standing around the fire. There were soldiers and other men that were standing around that fire, and they said, you're, you're one of those guys. You're, you're one of those guys and one of those followers. No, 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 that ain't me. I mean, he's still warming his hands. He's warming his hands on the fire. No, 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 that's not me. I, I don't know who you're talking about. It might be my twin brother, but it wasn't me. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say his twin brother. Don't try and hold that against me. But the third guy, the third guy was a relative of Malchus. You know the guy that Peter pulled out, cut his ear off? He was a close relative of Malchus's. He was there. He says, you're one of those guys that was in the garden. I mean, he's putting him in the garden. He says, I saw you in the garden with that Jesus guy. On the third time that Peter denied him, I mean, Peter felt the, the urge to, I guess he, just, he needed to go ahead and throw that deadliest catch language in there, and he began to, to curse. I am not the guy you're talking about. Well, the Word says he swore. You can take that how you want it. He was a fisherman. I don't think he was like, guys, I swear on my mama's life. No. <laughs> I think he let them know 
that he was not a Christ follower. In other words, he was this rough, tough guy, and he's not the one that you're looking for. I'm not the one you're looking for. And it says immediately the rooster crowed. And immediately at that very instance, Peter was reminded of what Jesus said to him, that you will deny me. It was at that very instance when Jesus and Peter locked eyes. And I, I, I don't really know. But you know when you do something you shouldn't do, you, you can see the disappointment in people when you let them down. You can see the disappointment, and you know it. Not only do you see it, but you, you feel it. You feel the disappointment that that other person has because of the decision that you made. But I want you to know today there's hope. Because whom he loves, which by the way, is every single person in this room. It's every single person watching us online. Whom he loves, he goes after. Amen. That means he goes after you. Not, no matter what you're in, what you're doing, where you find yourself, he's still chasing after you. Yes. Because he loves you that much. And there is hope in whatever situation you find yourself in. Peter messed up. Peter messed up just like, just like me. Peter messed up just like you. In fact, I, I would be curious. Since you came to Christ, since any of you came to Christ, since I came to Christ, I gave my life to Christ in 1995. Since then, since you came to Christ, how many people would say you've messed up? Raise your hand. For real. I mean, you've messed up. Hold your hands real high. For real. Hold them up. You've messed up. You made bad choices. You've made bad decisions. It's okay. Hold your hands up. Really. Look around. Look around you. This place is full of sinners. Let it be known sinners go to New Covenant Church. <laughs> of whom I am chief. Chief <laughs> sinner. But let me just tell you that there's hope. Amen. 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 There's hope. Yes. Because every single day I have to get up and I have to say, Lord, control my tongue. Yes, sir. Lord, control my actions. Lord, give me guidance in this decision. Because apart from you, I'm going to jack this whole thing up. And I do on a regular basis. But I want you to know, just like in the life of Peter, there's hope. There's life and there's resurrection in Jesus. Yes. And so I want you to know this today because this is what he's talking about. Jesus goes to very great lengths to chase you down. Yes. He, will, he will recreate situations. Now let me tell you something. God will never control you and he'll never force you. But let me tell you something. He'll make it hard on you. Yeah. Oh. He he will he will he will control the he'll control the situations to get you to think Amen. to bring you to that place that you make the decision whether you serve him or you don't. I mean he goes to great lengths. And I I want you to realize that because you think about you think about when after Jesus resurrected, after, after he came out of the grave, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Now yeah, think about this just for a minute. When he, was, when he came out of the grave and, and, and he began to be seen by, by people, he saw Mary Magdalene and he goes up to her and he says, why are you crying? He knew why she was crying. Why did he ask? <laughs> because he's working the situation. Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? He knew who he's looking for. She, she was looking for. She was looking for him. Who are you looking for? Isn't it interesting that, that when, when the angel told, um, told him, says, go get the other, told her, said, go get the other disciples and Peter. 
Have you ever noticed that? He said, the angel of the Lord said, Jesus is not here. He said, the one you're looking for has resurrected. Amen. He said, the one you're looking for is not dead no more. Hallelujah. And listen to this. He said, go get the other disciples and Peter. Why did he say and Peter? Isn't that interesting that it would say that? It's kind of like, say, like saying, go get the others and Michael. Because, see, let me tell you what shame does to you. When you make the wrong decision, when you start to condemn yourself because of something that you did or something that you said or something that you find yourself involved in that you should have never been involved in if you would have done what you were supposed to do, you begin to say, I'm not worthy and I'm not worth it and he doesn't love me, but he wants you to know that not only does he care about the other disciples, but he cares about you. Yes, yes, yes. And so I believe that it's important that he pointed out the fact that he not only wanted the, the disciples to come, but he wanted Peter to understand that even though he jacked it up bad, he even denied Jesus around this fire amongst other people. He made a confession, and you think to yourself, well, he denied Jesus. He don't deserve it. Let me tell you something, baby. You don't deserve it neither. And neither do I. But that is the love and the hope of of Jesus yes. is that he not only goes after the faithful followers but he goes after the ones that jack it up Woo, and say on. I want them to know that I'm oh. calling them by come name on, yes, sir. I'm calling you by name you, Jesus. Yes. that's how much I love you that's what Jesus is saying that's how much I love you is that I will call you by your name I'm not just going to say, yeah, I want my followers. No, I want, I want Tina. I want Amber. I want Tina. I want Sandra. I want Don. He's, whatever. He's going to call you, and he's going to call you by your name. Thank you, Jesus. And when you're standing before Jesus, he's not going to say, hey, follower. He's going to say, hey, Dale. Hey, Frenchie. Well, he might not call you Frenchie. He might call you Wilton. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to call you. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that he loves you so much that he's going to chase you down. I mean, do you remember? Do you remember? <laughs> this is funny because uh, w w Jesus, <laughs> this is how funny Jesus is, is that, is that Mary was like, she supposed that Jesus was the gardener. Why did she suppose that Jesus was the gardener? I mean, do gardeners look like Jesus? I mean, do, I mean, what? When Jesus came out of the tomb, I mean, was he putting a, together an arrangement? I mean, what? What? what why was she supposed? I mean, this is he, he will jack with your mind to get your attention. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know if he had some roses or if, if he was plowing the ground up or what he was doing. And she was like, just tell me where he's at because she supposed that he was a garden. But then when he said, Mary, her eyes were opened. This is the Savior. Her eyes were opened. I think Jesus just likes to jack with us sometimes. You know, it's kind of like when, <laughs> here's the thing, you know, Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus, right? He's walking with the guys, right? And, and they're like, they're talking about the situation. Like, man, I thought, I thought Jesus, I thought he was the guy, man. I thought, you know, he was the one. Jesus walks up to him and he's like, hey, guys, what y'all talking about? He's like, what, what y'all upset about? And he's like, who are you, man? What, you been living under a rock? You don't know what just took place? He's like, oh, you talking about that stuff, you know, that stuff that happened? You know, didn't, wasn't that prophecy being fulfilled? I mean, he's jacking with them. You know, and I mean, the whole way on the road, he's jacking with these guys. And they don't even know that this is Jesus because he's jacking with them. I don't know why they didn't understand him. I, I can't even, I don't know. I'm like, I would know. I'm like, Jesus, I've lived with you for three and a half years. I ought to know what you look like. But they didn't know. This is funny because they come to the house, you know, and Jesus is like, all right, guys, hey, y'all take it easy. Peace. <laughs> right? They's like, oh, well, hey, man, you want to come eat? And he's like, 
Oh, yeah, 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 I'll come eat. They still didn't know who he was until he got ready to break bread. And when it come time to break bread, he's like, hey, guys, it's me. And then he disappeared. <laughs> Just jacking with them. They're like, oh my God, didn't we burn on the inside? We thought that was the Messiah, but we didn't know it was the Messiah. But then we, we, we broke bread. He said, hey guys, it's me. He disappeared. And I'm like, what up? <laughs> That's just Jesus. I mean, Jesus jacks with us sometimes. You know, then he, oh, check this out. Then the guys, you know, these guys, they hot-footed back to town, right? And they're, they're like, guys, look, we saw Jesus. We were walking on the road. We were talking with Jesus. We didn't know it was Jesus, but we were talking to him about Jesus, which was himself. We told him all about the death, burial, and resurrection of himself, and he already knew that because he's the one that was died, buried, and resurrected. And, and we didn't know about it until we sat down at dinner, and then when we sat down at dinner, he was going to break the bread, and he said, hey, guys, it's me. Boom. And he left. Well, here we are now, and we're just letting you know. And then all of a sudden, Jesus Jesus, he didn't walk through the door. He just showed up in the room, freaked them out because he said, hey, peace be with you. And they were like, oh, my God, it's Jesus. He's freaking out. This is what Jesus does. He freaks you out. <laughs> Isn't that cool, though, that he does that? Yes. Sometimes we need to be freaked out. Yes, Father. <laughs> And it's awesome because he was like, oh, guys, y'all got some fried catfish. True. Check this out. You know, and he went to go eat the catfish. And he's like, guys, get up on some of this, man. This is good stuff. He was proving that he was real. He was eating the food. He's like, guys, this is good stuff. Come on up in here. And then he disappears again. I didn't mess with these guys. And this is what he does. Is he'll, he'll recreate situations in your life to get you to understand this is Jesus. This is the Savior talking specifically to me because he cares about every single person. It's an interesting situation that he recreates every one of these stories. He recreates every situation in your life. And y'all probably, you're probably, you're like, man, you have said so much. Would you please just go us, show us some scripture? Anybody want to see some scripture? Yes. Okay, I'm going to read 47 verses. No, I'm just kidding. Turn to John chapter 21. Because in John chapter 21, we see Jesus recreating something in Peter's life. Because this is how Jesus works. He's into the details. Jesus is into the details of your life. But in John chapter 21, it says, Later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it all happened. Several disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, uh, uh, the sons of uh, Zebedee, which is James and John, and, and a couple of other disciples. Now, the, you know, whatever, I don't, I don't know what they were talking about. I don't know if they were having a strategic meeting. Maybe they were having uh, some sort of, you know, deacon meeting or something. I don't know what they were having. They were just talking to Jesus. And uh, then all of a sudden, evidently, Peter got fed up. I don't think we really understand this until we really see the context. Because you have to know who Peter is. You have to know what Peter is all about. And understand the character of who Peter is. But Peter obviously got frustrated because he said, I am going fishing. And see, here's the thing. Here's the situation. If, if I told Tina, I'm going fishing. Well, she knows I'm just going to go grab my tackle box, or grab my fishing pole, and I'm going to go down to the, to the water because right now I don't have a boat motor to fit my boat. And so I'm going to fish off the bank. I'm going to go fishing. Maybe I'll catch something. Maybe I won't. But Peter is a fisherman by trade. When Peter said, I'm going fishing, they understood that Peter was saying, I'm going back to what I know. It, it's it's kind of like, it's kind of like when Michael Jackson, uh, not Michael Jackson, when Michael Jordan, <laughs> it, it's kind of like when Michael Jordan played baseball for a little while or he tried to because he's really not a baseball player he's a basketball player right it was kind of like that when he had that press conference and he says I'm going to play basketball they didn't have to guess it wasn't like hey you're going to play horse you're going to play a little one-on-one -on -one? what are you doing 
What are you doing, Michael? No, they knew he was going to play basketball. They knew who Michael Jordan was because Michael Jordan is basketball, right? They knew. There was no question. So when Peter said, I'm going fishing, they knew that Peter was saying, I've had enough of this. I'm going back to what I know. I'm tired of being a failure. I'm tired of messing up. I'm tired of doing things wrong. I'm tired of saying the wrong thing. I'm tired of, it's like every time I turn around, somebody wants to kill me. It does, you know, I know I told Jesus that I would die for him, but, you know, I was just saying that to make him feel good because he was about to get crucified. The guys were coming. They wanted to attack him, so I had to protect him, but I couldn't protect him because he told me if I tried to protect him, then I would have to die, and I really don't want to die. So I'm going to just go fishing. I'm going to go back fishing. I'm going to go back to what I know. And Jesus recreates the situation because he let him go. He says, and, and listen, this is that influence thing I was telling you about. He, it says, eh, we'll come too. They all said. You say you don't have influence over people? I say you do because people look up to you. And people sometimes are watching you from afar to see how you're responding, how you're reacting to a situation so that they'll learn how to do it. So all these guys say, eh, we'll go too. We're done. We've had enough of this. Look, we know that he's about to, you know, ascend. He says, I'm, you know, I'm only going to be here for a little while. I'm going to ascend. Y'all are going to be in charge. You know, I don't want to do that. So we're going fishing too. But listen to this. But they caught nothing all night. They Every single one of them, every single boat, every person, they fished all night long and caught nothing. It's kind of like running several strings of crab pods and coming up with nada. And you just spent a hundred thousand in fuel, you done fed your men three meals, and you got nada to show for it you did everything you knew to do because you're a fisherman by trade no one can tell you what to do you know every trick you know every avenue you know everything that needs to be done but they caught nothing let me tell you something God will jack with you just to get your attention he, he will manipulate the situation just to get your attention not to force you to do something, but to get your attention to see just how much you need Jesus. Amen. And so these guys, I just see these guys. I just see this situation where it says that they caught nothing. And it's just hilarious. This is how Jesus works. It was that dawn that Jesus was standing on the beach in verse 4. But the disciples couldn't see who he was. They could just see this figure. They, did, they really couldn't recognize who it was on the shore. And it says here, it says, it says he calls out to them. Now, this translation, and I think this is a very poor translation, which this is the New Living Translation. It's what I preach primarily out. But it says, fellows, have you caught any fish? But in the real translation, the true translation of the word, he was like, hey, kids, are you done playing games? He was kind of demeaning them a little bit in, in his wordage, in the, in the verbiage that he chose to use in that particular instance. Some guys, I mean, some translations even use the word brothers. Again, poor translation, because really he, was try he wanted them to understand. Look, guys, you went out on your own, and you did what you wanted to do, and you failed at what you were wanting to do. But I want you to understand that this is Jesus. He says, guys, have you caught any fish? No. And then they said, or then Jesus says, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. And so they did, and they caught a haul in the net because they were so, there were so many fish. I don't think that that wordage gives that justice. When, when this, this figure, this, this person that is on the seashore telling the guys, hey guys, y'all got any fish? No, we didn't catch nothing all night long. Well, why don't you drop your nets on the other side? I think there was probably, I think Peter was ticked off. That's my, just my opinion. I think Peter didn't want this criticism. And I think Peter said, I've been fishing all night long. 
You're telling me to drop my net on the other side of the boat like there ain't no fish on this side and you want me to drop my net on that side? I, that's just Peter. That's what I think. Makes me feel better knowing that that's Peter. <laughs> but I think that's what he did. Personally, I think he got frustrated. I think he got mad. Oh, well, I'll, I'll just show you. I'm going to go ahead and drop my net on the other side just to show that you don't know nothing. I've been fishing all night long. This is the same exact way that Jesus called Peter to begin with. I don't know if y'all realize this or not, but if you go back in Scripture and you see that Jesus was teaching on the seashore, this is at the very beginning of his ministry. He was teaching on the side of the seashore of the Sea of Galilee, and the people were coming by the droves to hear Jesus. And so Jesus got into a boat, which happened to be Peter's, and he told Peter, he says, push off a ways. And when he got done teaching, he says, let's go out to the deep water and let down your net. Jesus, I've been fishing. Now, see, he was a little bit calmer at the beginning. Jesus. I've been fishing all night long. There ain't nothing out there. Well, let's just try it. Let's just go out there and drop the nets. And it says that the nets were so full that he called his partners over, which was James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They all fished together. And it says that their nets were full and their boats were about to sink. And it says that Peter fell to his knees. Ooh, these are white pants. He fell to his knees. And he said, Lord, get away from me. I am the worst of all sinners that you have ever talked to. I don't even deserve for you to be in my boat. God just came into his boat. And he recognized who he was in the midst of. And Peter said, or Jesus said to Peter, he says, come follow me, and I'm going to make you fishers of men. In John chapter 21, Jesus recreates that scene in Peter's life so that he would understand that this is Jesus talking to you. And he recreated this scene of when he called Peter to come and follow him. He says, I'm not going to stop right there. I want you to see something else. Go ahead and come to the front, Veronica. Um, but in this, in this story, look at John 21. So Jesus said, he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. And so they did. And I'm sure it meant much frustration, but they did what Jesus said to do. And it says that it says the disciple uh, that Jesus loved. Now, this is John. Okay, so John turns to Peter and says, Peter, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic. You see, you've got you to gotta get a picture of this. He recognized the fact that, that Jesus was calling him from the shoreline. He already knew Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. But you've got to understand that after Jesus recreated this scenario of when he first called him to be his follower, he recreated this entire scenario. Coincidence? No, ma'am. Orchestrated by God? 100%. You know what I believe that he wanted Peter to know? I believe he wanted Peter to know that not only did I call you way back then, but I'm still calling you today. And I'm not done with you, Peter. Just like some of you today may be sitting in this room, maybe some of you watching online right now are saying, okay, I got called a long time ago. And I served God for a long time. Man, I was in youth group and I was in, you know, I was in the young adults class and, and I took all these discipleship courses and I, I served God. And man, I would go out 
when they would have an outreach and I was I was evangelizing my city and I would be in the hands and feet of Jesus. But something happened in my life and I made a decision and, and then and I'm down this road that I find myself on and I don't find myself anywhere around Jesus, but Jesus is recreating that moment in your life when he first called you because he says, I still love you. And no matter what you've done and what you've said, I still love you and I still want you. Now see, Jesus doesn't stop there. Because when he does things, he doesn't go halfway, he goes all the way. And he wants you to know how much you love he loves you. Because we see we see Peter putting on his clothes because he'd been working. He puts his clothes on and it some translations say he just kind of flopped overboard and began to swim to the shore. Now in the story, they're only about 100 yards from the shore. They're not very far. They're, they're probably as far as this building is to the highway. But Peter felt this urgency to get to the Savior. Peter's swimming. It wasn't pretty. He didn't do a swan dive off of the bow of the boat. He just flopped over in the water. And I want you to know something, that coming back to Jesus sometimes ain't pretty. Sometimes it's just falling overboard and saying, Jesus, I'm all in. And that's all he cares about is that you are all in. I get so sick and tired of people claiming all these different scriptures and taking scriptures out of context and saying, you've got to do this and you've got to do this for Jesus to love you. Let me tell you something. The thing that you need to do for Jesus to love you is to go all in, fall overboard, whatever it looks like. And he says, I'll accept you just like you are. But that's not all. There's more. Because once Jesus got to the shoreline, once they got there in verse 9, it says, When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire. Jesus asked them, Hey guys, y'all got any fish? He already, he already had what they needed. He already had it. He was frying fish while they were out there trying to catch fish, trying to do it their own way, he had the supply waiting on them at the shoreline. This is key. Listen, this is key in this verse of Scripture when it says that, they were, that, that there was fish cooking over a charcoal fire. This is extremely critical information in this story. Because this word in the Greek about a charcoal fire is only found twice in Scripture. Two times in the entire Word of God, you will find the wording for charcoal fire. You find it right here where Jesus is recreating the scene and saying, Peter, come, come back to me. The only other place you see this is in John chapter 18. When, when Peter himself was standing around the fire in John 18, 18, it says it was cold and the servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. And this is the very place that Peter denied Jesus three times. Let me tell you something. Not only will Jesus recreate the scene of your first coming to him so that he can let you know I love you but he will recreate the scene of your failure and he will show you in the scene of that failure that I am redeeming you and I am taking you from what you thought you were doing and I'm putting you back in right standing with me let me tell you something he didn't have to say hey Peter I'm going to wipe away your charges. I'm going to get rid of everything you've done. 
everything you've said, I'm just going to get rid of. He didn't do that because he's already died. He's already been buried. He's already been resurrected. The price has already been paid. He's saying, Peter, not only do I love you, but I am redeeming you in this place where you failed me. You have been redeemed and set free. Come back to me because no one else can make you as clean as me. This is the scene that Jesus has recreated in Peter's life. And I, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what they were saying. Jesus didn't need their fish. Jesus was proving something to them. Because Jesus said, bring, bring some of those fish that you've caught. It doesn't say anybody else. It says Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net. Y'all got to see this. Because Jesus, or, or Simon Peter didn't just go grab a couple of mackerel. He didn't go get one catfish. He didn't go get one speckled trout. Whatever the fish were, I don't know. He didn't go get one. He drug the whole entire net. You know what he was saying? Everything you have given me, I'm bringing to you. I'm going to bring everything. Overflow, because that's what this is. This is overflow. This was not just what they needed. It says that there were 153 large fish. The net had not torn. Let me tell you something. When you bring everything to God, not only will he keep your net from tearing, he will put more in it than you could ever imagine. That's got nothing to do with money. That's got to do with you selling out and saying, I'm going to drag everything i got, and I'm going to bring it to the charcoal fire, and I'm going to give it to you. He says here, listen, you know what he was telling Peter? I've got this for you. Y'all didn't have to toil. I got it. I got you. It says that Jesus served them bread and fish. He gave them bread and fish. And it says that this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. And after they got done eating in verse 15, is when he turned and he looked at Peter and he said, Simon, son of John. Simon, son of John. Now listen, I don't know how y'all growed up, but when my whole entire name got called out, it wasn't good. When, when my mom or my grandma or my grandfather or somebody said, Michael Dean Halliburton, I come to attention. Jesus is called, he wants, he wants Peter's undivided attention. Simon, son of John. You made some bad decisions in your life, Simon. But I want you to know that I've already atoned for those decisions. And not only am I showing you that I love you, I'm showing you that I'm redeeming you from place of failure and I still have a purpose for you some of you in this room right now some of you watching online right now have made some failures in your life you've made some bad decisions we don't have to get all hyped up about it you don't have to roll around flop on the floor like a fish and you know speaking in tongues and all that although that's wonderful stuff great things the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you takes control that's wonderful all that don't have to happen. You don't have to crawl on bits of broken glass. You don't have to self-torture yourself to get Jesus to love you. But he'll bring you back to that place of failure just to let you know that he loves you. And, and you know what he says in that place of failure? Because a lot of people don't want to go back to the place of failure. You try to, you try to suppress that failure in your life. You try, to, you try to smush it down and 
you don't want nobody to know about some of the things that you've done, some of the things that you've said in your life. You would rather just lock them in a vault and keep them there for the rest of your life. But you see, as long as you've got that vault in your life, the enemy has something to draw from. Let me tell you something. Jesus says, I've redeemed you. I've washed you. You are no more condemned. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. This is what Jesus is doing. He's telling not only Peter in this moment, but he's telling you. He's telling you. He's telling everyone in the world, watching all around the world. He's telling you, I still have a purpose. And I am waiting for you to come to that place of brokenness so that I can show you healing in that brokenness and that I can put you back on path to where I have called you to. This is where Peter finds himself because Jesus is telling Peter, I still have something for you. It was after breakfast that he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? This is another one of those rhetorical questions because Jesus knew the answer. But it gets your wheels to thinking. It gets your wheels to turning. He says, do you love me more than this? Yeah, Lord. You know I love you. He said, then feed my lambs. And Jesus repeated the question again in verse 16. He said, Simon, son of John, Again, full name. He wants Peter's undivided attention. So many of us give God divided attention. I'll just give you a little bit of my time, God, but I've really got a lot of important things to do today. I remember when Charles used to give the illustration about this, about how our children would want to have a conversation with us. And then when you're not really paying attention because you're more concerned about whether or not they're really running the Daytona 500 or not, or whether or not they're going to have the opening kickoff, or who's the halftime show, or whatever's going on, and they will grab you by your face, and they will jerk your head into alignment with them so that they can have eye contact with you. This is God. God is grabbing a hold of, of Simon's face and saying, Divided attention. Simon, son of John. Just like a little child grabbing his mom or dad or his grandma or grandpa's face saying, I love you. This is what God is doing right now to Peter. He's saying, Simon, son of John, I want your attention because I want to know. Even though he knew the answer, he was saying, I want you to come to this understanding that I love you so much. Do you love me? He says, you know that I do. And he says again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you, Lord. How many more times do I need to say it? I love you. And he doesn't say, yeah, well, you know, Peter, you did say that you would die for me and you ran away. He he doesn't remind him of that. He doesn't say, yeah, you know, Simon, you, you said that you would uh, you would never forsake me. You would never you would never deny me, but you did it three times. He never reminded him of all those things. Let me tell you something. If you keep getting reminded, if you are continually reminded of your past and your wrong decisions, it's not God reminding you. It is the enemy drawing from something that you will not let go of something that you are pressing down in a vault in your life and saying I just want to hold on to this because so and so wronged me and I will I'm going to have an opportunity in my life at some point where I can shove it down her throat shove it down his throat and I'm telling you right now you are letting that past dominate your life he's telling Simon Simon son of John he says it one more time Well, after he says, take care of my sheep, he says for a third time, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, in the context of this, Peter's feelings kind of got hurt. But he said, I want you to feed my sheep. You know what? You know what he was saying to Peter? He was saying, Peter, stop living in shame of your Stop living with your head down, staring at the ground because of a decision that you made yesterday. I 
met you at the charcoal fire to show you that I've redeemed you. To show you that I have cleansed you. Now I want you to hold your head up and I want you to look around because this world is full of sheep. This world is full of people that need me. And you might be sitting here today, like I've already said, and those that are watching online might be saying, well, you know, I'm not a voice, I'm not a preacher, I'm not anybody, but I'm telling you, someone looks up to you. Someone is watching you. Whether it's a little child, a niece, a nephew, a sister or a brother, a co-worker, Someone is watching you. And someone is looking up to you. Because the answer is in you. The answer is there. The answer is for us to carry to the world. We don't recreate the scenarios. We don't recreate the charcoal fires in people's lives. God does that. But God could very well be using you as a coal in that fire. Are you willing to burn hot so that people can see the fire of God in your life? Or are you wanting to be one of those charcoals that gets shoved off to the side and just slowly but surely just withers away and turns old and dusty again? I don't know about y'all, but I want to be red hot fire coal in the middle of the charcoal fire. When people look at me, I want them to see Jesus. I want them to see redemption. I want them to see that God took me from who I used to be, just like I was, and said, I've got a job for you. There is a world full of sheep. And I don't know if you know, but all throughout the scripture, Jesus refers to us as sheep because we need him. We need a shepherd. A sheep cannot survive without the shepherd. Now, listen to me. Don't, don't get offended by this. I've, I've worked this thing up to this point. Don't get offended by what I'm about to say. But sheep are really dumb. Now, I'm included. I'm dumb. So, sheep, sheep could die. There could be a bucket of water right there. And sheep will die looking at it because they don't know to walk a little bit further and lick. That's just how they are. They need the shepherd. They need the shepherd to, to ward off all of the attacks that are coming from all over. To protect them. They cannot defend themselves. For real. In real life. We need Jesus. I need Jesus. And I need him to redeem me. Let me tell you something, that charcoal fire, that ain't a one-time thing. I find myself at that charcoal fire quite often. And I find myself being reminded by Jesus, son, I still love you. Son, I still have something for you. Come back to me. Come back to me. Let's stand to our feet as she plays. And just let the Holy Spirit talk to you. I pray that, I pray that throughout this message that you have been hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, that you haven't been hearing Michael. I, I'm just the mouthpiece, but you've been hearing Jesus speak through me. I, I pray that you're hearing, and I pray that I pray that you're at the place where you're saying, I, I have found myself saying, I'm going back fishing. I'm going back to my old I'm going back to that because there's people. There's people in this world that they've served Jesus. They've given themselves to him, but they, they've made decisions. And they find themselves far away from him because of a decision, a word. Maybe someone hurt you in your life. Maybe they, they said something, a mom or a dad. They, they spoke words of condemnation over their children, and, and their children have been just under the weight of that condemnation their whole life. And they've gone, they've fallen back into that. Or maybe it was something that someone did. Or maybe it was a decision that we made in our past. And we're, we're letting that past control us. And I'm just saying, come back to the fire. Come back.
back to that charcoal fire. Come back to that place of disappointment. Come back to that place of bad decision. Come back to that place and let him show you that he has healing for you. That he has a 